Welcome to Snoozecast, the podcast designed to help you fall asleep. Find us at snoozecast.com and now also on YouTube. If you enjoy our show, please write a review on the Apple Podcasts app. Or if you don't have an Apple device, at podchaser.com slash snoozecast. Also, you can share us with a friend. This episode is brought to you by Faded Ferns and Brambles. Tonight, we'll read the conclusion to the adventure of Silver Blaze, a story found in the memoirs of Sherlock Holmes, written by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and published in 1892. If you haven't listened to the first half of this story yet, it was the episode that aired right before this one. In the first episode, Sherlock and Watson travel to Dartmoor to investigate the disappearance of the great racehorse Silver Blaze and the murder of the horse's trainer, John Straker. Bookmaker Fitzroy Simpson had come to Dartmoor to gather information about Silver Blaze and his stablemate, Bayard. He had approached both Straker's maid and his stable boy the night of the horse's disappearance and has been arrested for the murder. Let's get cozy. Close your eyes. Relax your body into the softness of your bed. Now, take a few deep breaths. Holmes and I walked slowly across the moor. The sun was beginning to sink behind the stables of Mapleton, and the long, sloping plain in front of us was tinged with gold, deepening into rich, ruddy browns, where the faded ferns and brambles caught the evening light. But the glories of the landscape were all wasted upon my companion, who was sunk in the deepest thought. It's this way, Watson said he at last. We may leave the question of who killed John Straker for the instant and confine ourselves to finding out what has become of the horse. Now supposing that he broke away during or after the tragedy, where could he have gone to? And why should gypsies kidnap him? They always clear out when they hear of trouble, for they do not wish to be pestered by the police. They could not hope to sell such a horse. They would run a great risk and gain nothing by taking him. Surely that is clear. Where is he then? I have already said that he must have gone to King's Pyland or to Mapleton. He is not at King's Pyland. Therefore, he is at Mapleton. Let us take that as a working hypothesis and see what it leads us to. This part of the moor, as the inspector remarked, is very hard and dry, but it falls away towards Mapleton, and you can see from here that there is a long hollow over yonder, which must have been very wet on Monday night. If our supposition is correct, then the horse must have crossed that, and there is the point where we should look for his tracks, we had been walking briskly during the conversation, and a few more minutes brought us to the hollow in question. At Holmes' request, I walked down the bank to the right and he to the left, but I had not taken fifty paces before I heard him give a shout and saw him waving his hands to me. The track of a horse was plainly outlined in the soft earth in front of him, and the shoe which he took from his pocket exactly fitted the impression. See the value of imagination, said Holmes. It is the one quality which Gregory lacks. We imagined what might have happened, acted upon the supposition, 
and find ourselves justified. Let us proceed. We crossed the marshy bottom and passed over a quarter of a mile of dry, hard turf. Again, the ground sloped, and again we came on the tracks. Then we lost them for half a mile, but only to pick them up once more quite close to Mapleton. It was Holmes who saw them first, and he stood pointing with a look of triumph upon his face. A man's track was visible beside the horses. The horse was alone before, I cried. Quite so. It was alone before. Hello, what is this? The doubled track turned sharp off and took the direction of King's Pyland. Holmes whistled, and we both followed along after it. His eyes were on the trail, but I happened to look a little to one side and saw to my surprise the same tracks coming back again in the opposite direction. One for you, Watson, said Holmes, when I pointed it out. You have saved us a long walk, which would have brought us back on our own traces. Let us follow the return track. We had not to go far. It ended at the paving of asphalt, which led up to the gates of the Mapleton stables. As we approached, a groom ran out from them. We don't want any loiterers around here, said he. I only wished to ask a question, said Holmes, with his finger and thumb in his waistcoat pocket, as a fierce-looking elderly man strode out from the gate with a hunting crop swinging in his hand. He cried, What the devil do you want here? Ten minutes talk with you, my good sir, said Holmes, in the sweetest of voices. I have no time to talk to every gad about. We want no strangers here. Be off, or you may find a dog at your heels. Holmes leaned forward and whispered something in the trainer's ear. He started violently and flushed to the temples. It's a lie, he shouted. An infernal lie. Very good. Shall we argue about it here, in public, or talk it over in your parlor? Uh, come in if you wish to. Holmes smiled. I shall not keep you more than a few minutes, Watson, said he. Now, Mr. Brown, I am quite at your disposal. It was twenty minutes and the reds had all faded into greys before Holmes and the trainer reappeared. Never have I seen such a change as had been brought about in Silas Brown in that short time. His face was ashy pale, beads of perspiration shone upon his brow, and his hand shook until the hunting crop wagged like a branch in the wind. His bullying, overbearing manner was all gone too, and he cringed along at my companion's side like a dog with its master. Your instructions will be done. It shall all be done, said he. There must be no mistake, said Holmes, looking round at him. The other winced as he read the menace in his eyes. Oh no, there shall be no mistake. It shall be there. Should I change it first or not? Holmes thought a little, and then burst out laughing. No, don't, said he. I shall write to you about it. No tricks now, or... Oh, you can trust me. You can trust me. Yes, I think I can. Well, you shall hear from me tomorrow. He turned upon his heel, disregarding the trembling hand which the other held out to him, and we set off for King's Pie Land. A more perfect compound of the bully, coward, and sneak than Master Silas Brown I have seldom met with, remarked Holmes, as we trudged along together. He has the horse, then? He tried to bluster out of it, but I described to him so exactly what his actions had been upon that morning that he is convinced that I was watching him. Of course, you observed the peculiarly square toes in the impressions, and that his own boots exactly corresponded to them. Again, of course, no subordinate 
would have dared to do such a thing. I described to him how, when according to his custom he was the first down, he perceived a strange horse wandering over the moor, how he went out to it, and his astonishment at recognizing from the white forehead, which has given the favorite its name, that chance had put in his power the only horse which could beat the one upon which he had put his money. Then I described how his first impulse had been to lead him back to King's Pyland, and how the devil had shown him how he could hide the horse until the race was over, and how he had led it back and concealed it at Mapleton. When I told him every detail, he gave it up and thought only of saving his own skin. But his stables had been searched. Oh, and an old horse faker like him has many a dodge. But are you not afraid to leave the horse in power now, since he has every interest in injuring it? My dear fellow, he will guard it as the apple of his eye. He knows that his only hope of mercy is to produce it safe. Colonel Ross did not impress me as a man who would be likely to show much mercy in any case. The matter does not rest with Colonel Ross. I follow my own methods and tell as much or as little as I choose. That is the advantage of being unofficial. I don't know whether you observed it, Watson, but the Colonel's manner has been just a trifle cavalier to me. I am inclined now to have a little amusement at his expense. Say nothing to him about the horse. Certainly not without your permission. And of course, this is all quite a minor point compared to the question of who killed John Straker. And you will devote yourself to that? On the contrary, we both go back to London by the night train. I was thunderstruck by my friend's words. We had only been a few hours in Devonshire, and that he should give up an investigation which he had begun so brilliantly was quite incomprehensible to me. Not a word more could I draw from him until we were back at the trainer's house. The colonel and the inspector were awaiting us in the parlor. My friend and I return to town by the night express, said Holmes. We have had a charming little breath of your beautiful Dartmoor air. The inspector opened his eyes, and the colonel's lip curled in a sneer. So you despair of arresting the murderer of poor Straker, said he. Holmes shrugged his shoulders. There are certainly grave difficulties in the way, said he. I have every hope, however, that your horse will start upon Tuesday, and I beg that you will have your jockey in readiness. Might I ask for a photograph of Mr. John Straker? The inspector took one from an envelope and handed it to him. My dear Gregory, you anticipate all my wants. If I might ask you to wait here for an instant, I have a question which I should like to put to the maid. I must say that I am rather disappointed in our London consultant, said Colonel Ross, bluntly, as my friend left the room. I do not see that we are any further than when he came. At least you have his assurance that your horse will run said I. Yes, I have his assurance, said the colonel, with a shrug of his shoulders. I should prefer to have the horse. I was about to make some reply in defense of my friend when he entered the room again. Now, gentlemen, said he, I am quite ready for Tavistock. As we stepped into the carriage, one of the stable lads held the door open for us. A sudden idea seemed to occur to Holmes, for he leaned forward and touched the lad upon the sleeve. You don't have a few sheep in the paddock, he said. 
Who attends to them? I do, sir. Have you noticed anything amiss with them of late? Well, sir, not of much account. But three of them have gone lame, sir. I could see that Holmes was extremely pleased, for he chuckled and rubbed his hands together. A long shot, Watson, a very long shot, said he, pinching my arm. Gregory, let me recommend to your attention this singular epidemic among the sheep. Drive on, coachman. Colonel Ross still wore an expression which showed the poor opinion which he had formed of my companion's ability. But I saw by the inspector's face that his attention had been keenly aroused. You consider that to be important? He asked. Exceedingly so. Is there any point to which you would wish to draw my attention? To the curious incident of the dog in the night time. The dog did nothing in the night time. That was the curious incident, remarked Sherlock Holmes. Four days later, Holmes and I were again in the train, bound for Winchester to see the race for the Wessex Cup. Colonel Ross met us by appointment outside the station, and we drove in his drag to the course beyond the town. His face was grave, and his manner was cold in the extreme. I have seen nothing of my horse, said he. I suppose that you would know him when you saw him, asked Holmes. The colonel was very angry. I have been on the turf for twenty years, and never was asked such a question as that before, said he. A child with no silver blaze, with his white forehead and his mottled-off foreleg. How is the betting? Well, that is the curious part of it. You could have got fifteen to one yesterday, but the price has become shorter and shorter, until you can hardly get three to one now. Hmm, said Holmes. Somebody knows something. That is clear. We scratched our other one and put all hopes on your word, said the colonel. Why? What is that? Silver Blaze favorite? Five to four against Silver Blaze, roared the ring. Five to four against Silver Blaze. Five to fifteen against Desborough. Five to four on the field. There are the numbers up, I cried. They are all six there. All six there? Then my horse is running, cried the colonel in great agitation. But I don't see him. My colors have not passed. Only five have passed. This must be he. As I spoke, a powerful bay horse swept out from the weighing enclosure and cantered past us bearing on its back the well-known black and red of the colonel. That's not my horse, cried the owner. That beast has not a white hair upon its body. What is this that you have done, Mr. Holmes? Well, well, let us see how he gets on, said my friend. For a few minutes, he gazed through my field glass. Capital, an excellent start, he cried suddenly. There they are, coming around the curve. From our drag, we had a superb view as they came up the straight. The six horses were so close together that a carpet could have covered them. But halfway up, the yellow on the Mapleton stable showed to the front. Before they reached us, however, Desborough's bolt was shot and the colonel's horse, coming away with a rush, passed the post a good six lengths before its rival, the Duke of Balmoral's Iris, making a bad third. It's my race anyhow, gasped the colonel, passing his hand over his eyes. 
I confess that I can make neither head nor tail of it. Don't you think that you have kept up your mystery long enough, Mr. Holmes? Certainly, Colonel. You shall know everything. Let us all go around and have a look at the horse together. Here he is. He continued, as we made our way into the weighing enclosure, where only owners and their friends find admittance. You have only to wash his face and his leg in spirits of wine, and you will find that he is the same old silver blaze as ever. You take my breath away. I found him in the hands of a faker and took the liberty of running him just as he was sent over. My dear sir, you have done wonders. The horse looks very fit and well. It never went better in its life. I owe you a thousand apologies for having doubted your ability. You have done me a great service by recovering my horse. You should do me a greater still if you could lay your hands on the murderer of John Straker. I have done so, said Holmes, quietly. The colonel and I stared at him in amazement. You have got him? Where is he then? He is here. Here? Where? In my company. At this present moment. The colonel flushed angrily. I quite recognize that I am under obligations to you, Mr. Holmes, said he, but I must regard what you have just said as either a very bad joke or an insult. Sherlock Holmes laughed. I assure you that I have not associated you with the crime, Colonel, said he. The real murderer is standing immediately behind you. He stepped past and laid his hand upon the glossy neck of the thoroughbred. The horse? cried both the Colonel and myself. Yes, the horse, and it may lessen his guilt if I say that it was done in self-defense and that John Straker was a man who was entirely unworthy of your confidence. But there goes the bell, and as I stand to win a little on this next race, I shall defer a lengthy explanation until a more fitting time. We had the corner of a Pullman car to ourselves that evening as we whirled back to London, and I fancy that the journey was a short one to Colonel Ross as well as to myself, as we listened to our companion's narrative of the events which had occurred at the Dartmoor training stables upon the Monday night and the means by which he had unraveled them. I confess, said he, that any theories which I had formed from the newspaper reports were entirely erroneous, and yet there were indications there had they not been overlaid by other details which concealed their true import. I went to Devonshire with the conviction that Fitzroy Simpson was the true culprit, although of course I saw that the evidence against him was by no means complete. It was while I was in the carriage, just as we reached the trainer's house, that the immense significance of the curried mutton occurred to me. You may remember that I was distraught and remained sitting after you had all alighted. I was marveling in my own mind how I could possibly have overlooked so obvious a clue. I confess, said the colonel, that even now I cannot see how it helps us. It was the first link in my chain of reasoning. Powdered opium is by no means tasteless. The flavor is not disagreeable, but it is perceptible. Were it mixed with any ordinary dish, the eater would undoubtedly detect it, and would probably eat no more. A curry was exactly the medium which would disguise this taste. By no possible supposition could this stranger, Fitzroy Simpson, have caused curry to be served in the trainer's family that night, and it is surely too monstrous a coincidence to suppose that he happened to come along with powdered opium upon the very night when a dish happened to be served which would disguise the flavor. That 
is unthinkable. Therefore, Simpson becomes eliminated from the case, and our attention centers upon Straker and his wife, the only two people who could have chosen curried mutton for supper that night. The opium was added after the dish was set aside for the stable boy, for the others had the same for supper with no ill effects. Which of them, then, had access to the dish without the maid seeing them? Before deciding that question, I had grasped the significance of the silence of the dog. For one true inference invariably suggests others. The Simpson incident had shown me that a dog was kept in the stables, and yet, though someone had been in and had fetched out a horse, he had not barked enough to arouse the two lads in the loft. Obviously, the midnight visitor was someone whom the dog knew well. I was already convinced, or almost convinced, that John Straker went down to the stables in the dead of the night and took out Silver Blaze. For what purpose? For a dishonest one, obviously. Or why should he drug his own stable boy? And yet, I was at a loss to know why. There have been cases before now where trainers have made sure of great sums of money by laying against their own horses, through agents, and then preventing them from winning by fraud. Sometimes it is a pulling jockey. Sometimes it is some surer and subtler means. What was it here? I hoped that the contents of his pockets might help me to form a conclusion. And they did so. You cannot have forgotten the singular knife which was found in the dead man's hand, a knife which certainly no sane man would choose for a weapon. It was, as Dr. Watson told us, a form of knife which is used for the most delicate operations known in surgery. And it was used for a delicate operation that night. You must know, with your wide experience of turf matters, Colonel Ross, that it is possible to make a slight nick upon the tendons of a horse's ham and then to do it subcutaneously so as to leave absolutely no trace. A horse so treated would develop a slight lameness, which would be put down to a strain in exercise or a touch of rheumatism, but never to foul play. Villain! Scoundrel! cried the colonel. We have here the explanation of why John Straker wished to take the horse out onto the moor. So spirited a creature would have certainly roused the soundest of sleepers when it felt the prick of the knife. It was absolutely necessary to do it in the open air. I have been blind, cried the colonel. Of course that was why he needed the candle and struck the match. Undoubtedly. But in examining his belongings, I was fortunate enough to discover not only the method of the crime, but even its motives. As a man of the world, Colonel, you know that men do not carry other people's bills about in their pockets. We have most of us quite enough to do to settle our own. I at once concluded that Straker was leading a double life and keeping a second establishment. The nature of the bill showed that there was a lady in the case, and one who had expensive tastes. Liberal as you are with your servants, one can hardly expect that they can buy twenty guinea walking dresses for their ladies. I questioned Mrs. Straker as to the dress without her knowing it, and having satisfied myself that it had never reached her, I made a note of the milliner's address, and felt that by calling there with Straker's photograph I could easily dispose of the mythical Derbyshire. From that time on, all was plain. 
Straker had let out the horse to a hollow where his light would be invisible. Simpson, in his flight, had dropped his cravat, and Straker had picked it up, with some idea, perhaps, that he might use it in the securing the horse's leg. Once in the hollow, he had got behind the horse and had struck a light, but the creature frightened at the sudden glare, and with the strange instinct of animals feeling that some mischief was intended, had lashed out, and the steel shoe had struck Straker full on the forehead. He had already, in spite of the rain, taken off his overcoat in order to do his delicate task, and so, as he fell, his knife gashed his thigh. Do I make it clear? Wonderful, cried the colonel. Wonderful. You might have been there. My final shot was, I confess, a very long one. It struck me that so astute a man as Stryker would not undertake this delicate tendon nicking without a little practice. What could he practice on? My eyes fell upon the sheep, and I asked a question which, rather to my surprise, showed that my surmise was correct. When I returned to London, I called upon the milliner, who had recognized Straker as an excellent customer of the name of Derbyshire, who had a very dashing wife, with a strong partiality for expensive dresses. I have no doubt that this woman had plunged him over head and ears in debt and so led him into this miserable plot. You have explained all but one thing, cried the colonel. Where was the horse? Ah, it bolted and was cared for by one of your neighbors. We must have an amnesty in that direction, I think. This is Clapham Junction if I am not mistaken, and we shall be in Victoria in less than ten minutes. If you care to smoke a cigar in our rooms, Colonel, I shall be happy to give you any other details which might interest you.